You're very welcome along to the second episode of IRFU Rugby Stories. We're delighted to be joined by former Ireland captain Keith Wood and former All Black and former Ireland scrum coach Greg Feek. Thanks a million both for joining us. It's a pleasure, Ryan. Great to see you. Yeah, so we're going to look back in this episode on a, on a classic right? game really at Lansdowne Road from 2001, Ireland against the All Blacks. And while the result didn't go Ireland's way that day, Keith, I think um, it was a landmark day really for Irish rugby in the sense that 49,000 packed into Lansdowne Road and, and a team captain by yourself really put it um, to the All Blacks that day and, and it was a landmark moment. Uh, yeah, I, um, I struggle with that phraseology of calling it a landmark moment because um, I remember going on, on the run-up to that game and trying to get the prep right because we wanted a win. So, yes, we came very close and we were leading with maybe 25 to go. Um, but, uh, yeah, we got our asses handed us uh, by the end of the game. You know, we were well beaten by the end of the game. And it was funny. I remember I, I can remember as keenly now as I did then that that was the attitude from the press that, well, you know, we're close. Um, but we were well beaten. I was raging, actually. After the game, I was disconsolate because I thought this was a chance for us to beat New Zealand. And look, it took us an awful long time before we did beat them, you know. So there only are a few opportunities in your career to go and do it, and we were in a place to do it. And so for that, I was, I don't look at it as a landmark. I would be, I'd look at that as being a pretty big failure that we had in, in my time. Yeah. Greg, for you, was, I think it was your penultimate game in, in an All Blacks jersey. What do you remember of that occasion in Dublin? Well, first of all, um, it was a new coaching staff. There was a lot of new players. You would, you know, you probably would remember or heard that it was um, Aaron Major and Richard McCaw's first tests, and um, and there was a lot of kind of, I suppose, nerves uh, floating about um, because you're trying to impress this new coaching regime, um, John Mitchell actually and Robbie Deans, um, and luckily some of us knew Robbie, but. What stood out to me around that was before, just before kickoff, and this was the respect I think we had for Ireland as well. Was um, Byron Kelleher was uh, dry reaching and spewing in the toilet, and that's kind of was a regular sort of thing. But when you saw Jonah doing it as well, um, you realised okay, this is this is going to be a big one. We can set ourselves up if, if we've got those two guys that nervous that they're spewing up in the toilet, you know. Um, you know, five, ten minutes before kickoff. That that was from the start of it. And then hearing what Keith said at the end, you can you can kind of understand why he was um frustrated and disappointed in that in that loss. Um yeah, and the other thing was um I got nominated to lead that hucker for the first time as well. So that was another added stress for me. Um that I, I remember uh, been in the shower uh, every no matter where I was, I was, I was practicing and making sure I was getting it right. And I probably overemphasized it um, a little bit too much, the focus of it, and uh, you know maybe let it slip for a bit at the start. Myself yeah, personally, yeah. yeah. The week before you played that game, you played Ireland Day up in Belfast. How much did you know about this Ireland team coming into that game? Um, I think there's a couple of guys I, I was mates with that were going there, had been in Austin, we knew it was going to be tough, do you know what I mean? And obviously there was names in the Irish team we knew of, and there's always going to be names you don't. Um, and yeah, I think the whole the whole thing, the, the touring factor, um, you know, going overseas and doing the end of your tour was always a, a big challenge going to the North Hemisphere and, and trying to get some wins under the belt. Um, yeah. To be honest, I can't remember all the detail on that, but that's the, the stuff I pretty much can remember for now. But there's probably a lot more. Yeah. Well, if if I if I if I looked at it, Fiki, we had um, uh, I'd been back up to the tour to New Zealand in in '92, which was a long long time before that. I didn't get a chance to go out there. I sat on the bench in the World Cup in '95 against uh, against Joma and that All Black team, and we played them in '97. In Dublin, we'd seven new caps. Um, to be honest, we weren't even at the races, and um, 
uh, we were our structure at the time was was poor, was very poor, and uh, we were trying to figure out what professionalism meant for the IRFU, but for the players as well. And we were at loggerheads at different times, and but we had a different coach every nine months. Life became really, really difficult when that happened. And so 2001 for for us and for that particular group of players, because we, you know, we we played through a lot of bad days in the 90s when things hadn't gone well for us. So we saw this as a, as a chance and an opportunity. And we were also just on the change. So Warren Gatlin was under huge pressure, uh, colossal pressure. It ended up being his last game in charge. Um, uh, he almost went to ground in the couple of weeks before and we were trying to chop and change what we could go and do to play against the All Blacks because even though you had a lot of new guys there, um, you'd great guys. You know, you'd uh, Richie on Richie's first day. Richie was man of the match in that match, if I remember rightly. He was truly phenomenal. Uh, I remember having a good chat with him afterwards. But we felt that if we got our act together, that we could actually go and 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 play it properly. And actually, the key architect for that day for us was David Humphreys. And we had team meetings uh, before the English game a couple of weeks beforehand in that foot and mouth international. Um, and we had a meeting with myself and Eddie O'Sullivan and uh, Ronan O'Gara and Humphreys. And Humphreys is the senior 10, as he was at that stage, uh, and Warren Gatland. But uh, like Warren was under huge pressure and you could see it, it was all over him. And, and But Humphreys, with Eddie O'Sullivan that day, pretty much said, this is what we're going to do. This is where we see a weakness in the All Blacks. And prior to that time, we never talked about weaknesses in the All Blacks. And you, used, you had an aura with you that was, we had to try and break that down all the time. And uh, and I think for us, especially having a New Zealand coach, we wanted to make certain that you'd go and get that win and, and try and do it at that stage. But Humps set the place on fire in that first 20 minutes of that game. Everything he touched turned to gold. Um, and I think an awful lot of that was from that leadership role that he had taken on the day going up to it. Um, and it was a big day for me because John Mitchell was my first number eight when I played club rugby. So I knew Mitch really, really well. And now this is his first test as All Black coach. There was a bit of banter beforehand. And you know Mitch, banter isn't really his thing. Uh, he's a very serious guy. And uh, I look, I loved slagging him. I knew I could get under his skin. So um, so it was a big deal for that. And it was a big deal having Jonah in Lansdowne Road. And um, uh, look, I I still, I, it goes back. It was, we played some bloody great rugby. So for me, there was a great joy in that. But we started well. We started well standing at the hacker. Um, I was trying to get some of the guys to wink at ye to see if we could put you off. Like anything I ever tried in a hack, it never worked. We never beat New Zealand, but we were trying to smile and wink and and see if there any way of doing it. And it wasn't being disrespectful. Um, my belief always is that the hacker is fantastic, but it's overused. So I always think the fact that you get a chance to do something like that beforehand for me is an overuse of something. So, um, but it was your first time leading the hacker. Did it did it upset you? Did it put you off? Uh, I think I, I think looking back, yeah, I the fun. I mean, I still get if, if Aaron or the boys were here now, they'd be slagging me off because uh, I was I, I didn't have much. I, I still don't have any fast twitch fibers, but they reckon it was the fast attacker ever because <laughs> I was <laughs> out of win. And so you can imagine the shit I got for that afterwards, and and still now, um, and yeah, it probably it weighed on my mind a bit. But I mean, um, with my background. Um, and as a young kid, you know, growing up and seeing it, um, and you really, you might you didn't really see it until you got to high school in New Zealand, and then the All Blacks. That was that was you know for me that was uh, was a huge moment really, um, and I wanted to make sure I did that properly. But you know, playing for the All Blacks, I wasn't a to be fair to do even to be on this um, <clears throat> this uh, talk with you, Woody. I wasn't a season test player. You know what I mean? You're a season test player. I, I remember you and and going back in those days and you know um, to be here now and you know I think the relationship I have with Irish rugby is the main reason but obviously have some experiences but yeah that hacker thing I was really proud of and and playing every test match every minute I was proud of you know and I still 
I still, um, and obviously now, I arrived back in New Zealand and, and um, I've gone through stuff in storage. I still have stuff from that tour. Do you know what I mean? Hats and jackets and things like that because it meant so much to me. You know? um, and that haka certainly you know, has been relived a couple of times recently in terms of slagging offs as well. You know, But it's yeah. hard, mentally, you know, it takes a lot of space in your head and it was just wanting to get it right. Um, yeah, and I, I don't envy anyone that has to do the captaincy role, you know, and have that as well. You can see why that gets jobs now get distributed around the team more to be able to cope with all that, you know. Yeah, the captaincy is different. Captaincy is a bit different. I, I, I um, you know, in terms of, I, I shouldn't compare the two, but what I meant was, you know, I wasn't thrown into a captaincy role, but I was thrown into this role of. I'm representing a massive part of New Zealand and they're going to be just looking at that potentially. And that that's what it felt like for me. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah there's that, that, and you wanted to get that right. Um, but yeah, I mean, test matches, as you know, how many, how many did you play Woody? Just, uh, just to throw the number out there. Uh, I play, I'm actually, do you know what? I was just thinking whether I know the number. I 58 for Ireland and, um, uh, and five for the lines. Um, I used to always slag it because uh, Zinni had 58 tests for uh, for for the All Blacks, but he played 100 matches for New Zealand. But uh, I was just picking him all the time to say that we actually had the same number of, of, of international tests. But uh, yeah, the lines you sneak ahead. I missed nearly as many as I got, would you believe? I had a huge number of injuries. Um, this This game was my last real competitive game in Lansdowne Road in 2001. I played one more uh, warm-up game for the World Cup in 2003. I got injured a few weeks after this game and um, uh, all, their, all the other internationals I played were away from home, actually. Um, and I think maybe that kind of puts down to, again, you know there's only a few opportunities to win those big games and, uh, uh, and that wasn't, um, you know, that was one that kind of, rankles with me a little bit, if, if I'm honest, because you want to take these opportunities. They say we're an old man in a hurry, but I knew I was getting, even though I was young enough, I retired when I was 31, um, I knew there wasn't a huge amount more time left for me because I'd had a lot of injuries during my career. I think, yeah. I think those injuries were probably because you had speed like a back man, you know? Right, you know like, it's just wrong, it's wrong. It's incredible. Play in that position, you know. Like, uh, uh, well, I, I liked it, you know. It's it, probably because yeah. I didn't want to do some of the other stuff in the pack, but uh, <laughs> I did I enjoy it. From the game itself, you mentioned Ireland got off to a great start, and the, the part that rankles obviously is the fact that you, you threw away a lead against the All Blacks. What was the the kind of the message, or can you remember at half time even being in that position in the lead against the All Blacks at a packed Lansdowne Road? Well, like we weren't overexcited by it because it was half time, and we knew that. Uh, I, I I think the All Blacks were making some uncharacteristic errors, and actually, from from my career, you know that when a team isn't doing very well, you know they're going to have a purple patch when things do go well, right? So. Uh, you know, you're hoping they don't because that's a really good opportunity to win. But we were trying to do simple things and do them well. Um, one of my frustrations for, for that period of time was I'd been on the Lions in 2001 and we had Phil Larder as a defensive coach. And I, I, do you know what? He opened our eyes, I think, to, to what uh, a level of organisation could do for you. And up to that point, and including that All Black game, our defence was kind of harem scarum. So we always covered each other. And uh, on Lions tours, you don't. You actually, you're trusted to do your job. You should trust the structure that you're in. And in 2001, we were given an incredibly simplistic structure, but it was brilliant because it was simple. And uh, I had felt we needed to concentrate on that. And this match was five or six months afterwards. And in that period of time, we had not got a defensive coach. And we were still defending um, in a style that wasn't actually appropriate anymore. And by the time it got to 20 minutes to go, um, 
we were leaving more space on the field and we were we were wrecked because we we're covering each other. If you don't cover somebody, sometimes the opposition will score, but it means that you should have the energy in the tank in the last 15 or 20 minutes. So that would have been the big frustration um, that, that I had, that this was something that actually we didn't need to see on an international. We could have had that rectified and uh, and we just hadn't got our act together, you know, from, from the coaching ticket. We didn't have our act together in terms of, of putting that into place. And that for me was hugely frustrating. So uh, at halftime, I said, we're in a really good place. Let's just continue. So it wasn't about, like, we didn't tighten up. We didn't fear winning in that game. And there was times in the past we had feared winning, you know, and uh, uh, that may be an Irish particularly Irish thing. It's not an all black thing. It's definitely not an English thing where they have an expectation of winning all the time, even if they're not good enough. And that helps them in a lot of cases. But for us on that day, we didn't have a fear of winning. We still went out to play. We weren't trying to lock it all up and 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 tighten up. We weren't. We were trying to play. But ultimately, we started running out of gas. So it could be one guy missing a tackle, um, uh, exacerbated by another guy or, or a defensive line not coming up at all. And suddenly we were being exposed because one of the things that I knew from playing against the All Blacks was th- they tend to do the right thing at the right time. It's, and it tends to be really simple. So people keep talking about how complicated and brilliant their play is. It's not. It's the simple thing done really, really well. It's what I admire, actually, about the All Blacks, that it actually isn't overly complicated. It's not overly strength-based. It's very fit and very skills-oriented. And um, and they just started, every, every pass started to stick. Uh, and suddenly we're running around and Jonah, of course, when he gets the ball and we 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 played against Jonah well in that game but when he got the 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 ball in the right place for him there was no stopping him yeah. Greg I think John Mitchell described that Irish team as as one of the best he'd seen post match was there sense in the old black dressing room you know obviously maybe the score the end score and didn't reflect how close and competitive the the overall game was but was there a sense in the old black dressing room afterwards that um you know, there was a, a newfound respect there for Irish rugby. Hundred percent, yeah, definitely. And I think uh, Woody hit the nail on the head um, in terms of game plan because you know a lot of us that were in that team had played with Robbie Deans and Crusaders, and we had, and even now it's still applicable with the whole edges and middle of the park where you play. And because we had kept our width, kept our width, kept our width, we probably. At halftime, we probably ran around too much. So I remember at halftime, boys were pretty buggered, you know, like it was a. But then we kept to our system. We had a we had a shape, and that probably was the difference in the end because, like what he said, um, they probably ran out of steam by running, you know, working really really hard. But we just had a system that I think at the time worked for us, and that was, I suppose, at the end of it, we were able to grab onto that and say, well, we know this works. Up here, you know, in some ways, um, and and it's obviously that that kind of system has really evolved over the last, well, only a few years, eh, Woody? Um, it's really evolved into something quite special now. You know, everyone talks about the numbers that spread around the field, and um, and yeah, you know, I think we left that tour, and that was probably uh, the one game where definitely we went. If there had been one more try, or they had a, made that one tackle, or or just kept those people there, you know, that was it. But you know, we're pretty we're pretty realistic in terms of, you know, we we might have I don't know what what you guys thought of the All Blacks. It's interesting hearing Woody now and you know working with some of the Irish boys, but you know we're we're pretty honest with how we did things. And Mitch Mitch even had awards, and this is what I think made the boys even a bit nervous was after the um that Belfast warm up there was the. Player award, so the worst tackler and worst player award, and you know like that that was quite new and but, but different for the Kiwi boys. You know they had that sort of um, thing happening in your in your group. You know, so there was a bit, we're a bit on edge a bit going into that as well. Something a bit yeah. different. Yeah, it's it's funny. I would have had uh, I would have had a really big New Zealand influence uh, on my rugby with Gary O. So as I said, um, John Mitchell was my first number eight. Um, 
uh, Brent Anderson, you know, Buck uh, Anderson was my first second row who treated me with nothing but disrespect as a kid when I was 18 or 19. He just, he gave me a really, really hard time. And I, I love the fact he did. Um, uh, it's funny, I met with him last year and I would have said he maybe had the biggest influence on my career for uh, for improving work rate and for um Try to get the simple skills done well. He was he was relentless. We Murray kid from Taranaki was our was our coach who was incredibly process driven, um, which I liked because once you have a process, life becomes an awful lot easier. People know where they're going. But my favourite coach that we had afterwards was Andy Leslie, who former All Black captain, who he had no process, and he said, "But you've already got a process. Now I just want you to be happy and enjoy yourselves." And we we won all Ireland leagues with both those two entirely different um, philosophies on how to play. And I love the fact that they were so different and still you were able to win with it. But for me, it always came down to the key elements of simple skills, of simple tackle technique and uh, simple handling and running lines. So what we got exposed for at the end of, of, of that game was your running lines were still two or three people uh, on the inside, on the outside, in that little sort of uh, little V, there was always someone to 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 pop the ball off to. And in Mertens at ten, you had one of my favourite players of all time, and uh, I thought he looked like he was pulled backwards through a hedge. You know, he didn't look like a rugby player. He didn't have any physique of any of any element, but he had all the time in the world to do whatever he wanted. Uh, for me, he's one of my favourite rugby players, actually, because he just uh, he just had time. He had time to do anything. He was looking. It was like fast chess for him. He was looking at, at, at the way the board was laid out and he would decide uh, in his own time to make this move or that move. So what would happen in three or four moves? Hence, you know, I again, there were, some of those guys were, were truly, truly amazing. He was refereeing the game as well. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he and I both actually. Uh, there was a lot of, <laughs> lot of, a, lot of a lot of a lot of chat with the ref in, in those in those days, you know. But but we had a good relationship with a lot of the refs in those days too, you know, because there weren't as many cameras. The game was was far more uh, not physical but dirtier. Definitely, uh, you needed to have that blend between captains and and referee as to what would actually what would happen or not, you know. But especially, yeah. Uh... Believe it or not, I had a, I just had a flashback. Um, I actually took a line-out ball in that game. I don't know if you remember. I know, From me? I no, 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 no. I, was, I, was, line out. I actually I won was, the line-out. I was very good at throwing to the opposition. Yeah. It wasn't my throw. Was it? Yeah, but uh, <laughs> the thing I remember is not actually winning the line-out on, on our ball. Sorry. Yeah, um, I won the line-out, and I reckon within probably a hundredth of a second, the shoulder hits me, and oh my god, I was in. But it was the claw absolutely nailed me and buried me, and the burying continued. I remember it was. Uh, I just have to look at the claw. I've looked at it quickly, but that that was definitely a a moment in the game that that uh, just jumped out at me. Yeah, I've never I've never actually said thanks for that. Left plus yeah, the I, yeah, I will pass that on. Claw had an ability of uh, of being upset for no reason, so that was definitely one of them. You catching a lineup would have been a disgrace for him. But uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's funny, Claw had um, uh, Claw had the smallest legs in world rugby, a big old chest on him, um, and he could scrummage with his head on the ground. So if he had to scrummage for straight, straight on dealing with everybody i think he'd struggle at times but he was he was a decent tactician and technician and he was well able to maneuver his way around it but yeah claw was interesting i have to say um was he playing he was he tight headed that day or was he loose head uh, uh, the ball was tight head i'm pretty sure yeah yeah so claw was not a natural loose head um and he used to say to me at times i've got my side of the scrum up but he used to hang me out to dry to do it so yeah. <laughs> I have I have to say I love playing with those two lads. I, I they were great guys. I mean John again was six foot four, too big for tight head, but the most honest player. I mean the most honest player that you'd ever hope to play with. Never complained once, never um, 
uh, always gave everything to it. And sometimes he'd get caught in the wrong position and I'd get caught in the wrong position and hang him out to dry. Um, but uh, yeah, it was interesting. Scrums were a damn sight quicker in those days too, weren't they? They were. The whole that was quicker, yeah. And uh, yeah. it was over and done with. But I'm pretty sure, I might making this up, but did John Hayes ever lift in a line out with one arm? <laughs> you're, def- you're definitely making it up. But he used to lift... <laughs> He was, get him to lift. The way. he was a good line. Oh, be best, best in the world, I, I would have said. He used to lift Malcolm on his own. So he'd lift Malcolm yeah. entirely on his own. So at times we could have three pods. Um, did jump? I didn't think Malcolm jumped, did he? Did this, that was the rumours I heard. Well, so uh, well, no, he was people. there. Yeah, he was there and he was lifted, you know. That was that was about <laughs> it. But, um yeah, no, I, we always said it that Hayes or Mick Galway should buy pints for John Hayes for the rest of his life because yeah, when the lifting law changed, Hayes was nearly bigger than Golov. So, um, yeah, they were, they were a good partnership. Keith, I'm right in saying you were named World Rugby Player of the Year shortly after that game. I think it was a couple of weeks later. It must have been a, a great time for yourself personally as, as a player. You mentioned the extended... Six Nations that year due to the foot and mouth. It was a busy November period and your performances, I think, really rubber stamped that award, I suppose. Yeah, I, do you know what? I It's funny because it's very nice to have. You know, it's it was the first one and it's a, it's a really nice thing to have. I don't know what I think about awards um, and I'm not being coy about it. I uh, Individual awards for team sports are, you know, I... I, I'm always I'm, I'm unco- uncomfortable with them. Always always have been. Um, uh, I played well that year, to be honest. A lot of other guys played well, but Ireland played well that year. So I mean, the reason the, the reason for that, I went on a Lions tour. Uh, we won the European Conference with Harlequins. Uh, the foot and mouth matches. Um, if I'm brutally honest, in that year, I was disappointed. In that year, I thought we should have won the Six Nations. And I actually thought we should have beaten New Zealand. So I'd have taken those over over World Player of the Year any day of the week. And um, I look, I do think it's nice now. You look back at it and you say, God, that's a nice thing to have. But um, I'm still uncomfortable with uh, with individual awards for team sports. Sure. Greg, what about that occasion at Lansdowne Road? I think it was 49,000 packed in to the old stadium and even watching back the, the footage, there was, seemed to be people spilling out over the terraces on either at all four ends, I suppose. What was that occasion and that atmosphere like as, as a visiting player? Yeah, because everything was so close. It was just, it just felt, compared to New Zealand, it just felt really different. And did not just the crowd, but the whole makeup of the stadium, the coming in, the... The real, it was like real, obviously really traditional, and and uh, you know obviously you, you needed a new one, but it was we actually quite liked that. You know what I mean? There's something about it, and I feel quite lucky to have played in it. Um, it just had an aura about it. You know what I mean? I don't know what your Irish boys felt, but holy heck, it was. Uh, and I think that's probably where some of those nerves were coming from. You know what I mean? Like the boys spewing out the toilets and guys trying to go, hang on, this is there was a another sort of. Uh, but I'm not going on, you know what I mean? Like it was, it was cool. And, and even now, well, sorry, in the, in the last few years while I was in Ireland, um, those Munster Leinster matches in Dublin or those big Heineken Cup games or test matches in Dublin, like in that Aviva, just, I don't know, they still, it still has that, you know, like there's a vibe and a, um, a singing and I don't know, it's just, you, you can't, even, even friends of mine, family friends that come over and went to games, they leave just going, wow, I wish we could have that in New Zealand. Do you know what I mean? Um, if we could bring that back, bring the – and it's not just one or two things. And that's, that that day was was definitely special. Um, I, I, th- I think we needed a, a new stadium. and um, uh, I, But I do think we lost something in when the old Lansdowne was, was knocked down. Um, it was an absolute uh, – it was a crap stadium, empty. There was bits of – plaster falling off it looked awful it was gray it was dreadful the terraces were were really bleak looking but on big days Lansdowne Road was just it was absolutely amazing um I don't know if you remember it Ryan but there was 
there was about eight or nine steps you'd go. So the, the changing rooms were underground and you had eight or nine steps to, to go up, to get out onto the field. They were uh, tiled with a very shiny tile. Uh, the, the, the step wasn't wide enough for your whole foot to, to go on. So you were kind of tiptoeing on four studs to get up. There was a lot of guys slipped on the way out of there. Um, so it was crap down below. And then you'd come up and you're suddenly out into all this noise. And the terracing down on the left-hand side, as you'd come out of the field, that terracing was just mad and the noise. And there was a beat to Lansdowne Road. There was a kind of a cadence, a higher and a lower noise that was was extraordinary. Um, look, I always felt there was... I, it was old amateur time, almost. You know, it was a throwback, most definitely. Um, but... I, for me, I, I just think um, the Aviva Stadium didn't quite capture all of that. I think Thoman Park has managed to hold on to a little bit more because it kept some of the terracing. Now, you have to do it because you need more people to go in. And, and actually, the Aviva has got so much more going for it than old uh, Lansdowne Road had. But there was just that sense of proximity. I mean, you're running through people. There was people hanging in over the fence. You know, there was there was no distance between the supporters and the players. Um, I remember I remember giving tickets uh, to that game actually to to one of my friends, and I, I don't know where I got the tickets from, but I ended up having two tickets just on the halfway line, just on pitch side. Um, and he actually he, he was a guy who never played, and he was a huge fan. And he said he didn't actually want to sit there anymore if that was possible because he thought the hits were too much. It was too close to the action. It was almost too real for him. He liked to watch it a little bit more from afar because it was you could be that close in, in that stadium. But I, I mean, I loved it. It was my favourite place to play, Barno. Um, uh, I loved um, Kings Park in Durban and I loved uh, playing a couple of matches in... Um, uh, in Australia that I love, you know, my first game in Ballymore, which is a real old fashioned uh, stadium and, you know, Twickenham, which is 82,000. But there's something beautiful about the 49 and a half thousand people in Lansdowne. It's a great, it was a great place. Yeah. Maybe to, to finish up, we've mentioned John Lomu's name a couple of times throughout the conversation. Greg, I might start by asking you, what was it like playing on the, on the same team as, as, as a player like that and being in that same dressing room as him? Yeah, I had, he was, um, it's funny because he's, I think it was his birthday not long ago and there was a little bit of a, a thing done on him and, he was in, um, and it makes you reflect back. Um, he was actually an extremely generous guy. One of, that's one, one thing I remember about him, not just giving stuff, but, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but the time as well, his time. Um, you know, he'd always go of his way to help out. And I remember, what do you laugh at this, but the, the, 99 World Cup, I was actually covering hooker, right? And I hadn't thrown a ball. <laughs> and I had to cover hooker because, you know, four cups. And uh, so Fitzy helped me with my throwing and tried to give me some lessons before I went. And and uh, Jonah decided to put his hand up and, and actually help me. You know what I mean? And the, you know what the worst thing was? He was so much better at me straight away. Like he could do it with one hand and nail now throw it was embarrassing and we'll be in airports and i'll be practicing and you know so fast forward to this too i had a little bit of a relationship with him and a little bit of respect because i was a little bit uh taken back by it um that he was helping me out you know what i mean just this is the way i did it with everybody um and the only other story that was probably more embarrassing in some ways you guys can decide on that was um we were walking out of the hotel and I was a bit late, forgot, couldn't find my bag. You know, it's like, what are you getting to get, get on the bus? Grab my bag and walked out. <clears throat> and the whole crowd just erupted. Most of the boys were already on the bus by now. All the whole crowd erupted and I kind of got a bit of a shock, you know, and uh, kind of looked around and kind of just put my hand up and kind of, you know, waved and, you know, thought, geez, it's uh, hell the hell they know me. And I uh, walked down and the boys on the bus were crying, you know, and, uh, then I froze and just turned around and Jonah was right behind me. You know what I mean? And, and you can imagine, you can imagine the shit I got for that. And it was brilliant. After the game, you know, the boys were still didn't shut a shit about it. And uh, again, he kind of, you know, would always kind of say, don't worry about it. And he was supportive. And uh, no, and 
I think he just, yeah, and, and what, he probably was the first guy that you'll see it a lot in Super Rugby at the moment where boys are just being themselves, whether it's haircuts, do it, you know, just being themselves. That was him as well, you know, and he probably was ahead of his time with stuff like that. He needed to be himself to be able to play at his best, you know, and that was music on, happy, talking around, not getting too pumped up and relaxed. So it was quite calming in some ways, but when you're caught between the old school and the new school, you didn't know which way to go, some guys. Um, but he was, he was dead set. This is how I'm going to be. This is what works for me. You know, big, it was the old ghetto blaster up on the uh, wall there, you know. Yeah, he was definitely, uh, he was definitely himself. And he was, he was the superstar. Um, yeah. Nobody else came anywhere close. He brought the game to a higher level uh, in many respects. And I know this for being, uh, again, reading it recently, the game wouldn't have gone professional if Jonah hadn't gone professional with it. He was essential for the game to change. Um, he was a sweet man. I mean, you talk about having time for people. He had time for everybody. And um, he, uh, we had, we swapped jerseys after the game. I knew Jonah very well. I'd got to know him uh, quite well. And um, uh, I, so I had two jerseys in that match. The first one uh, I took off at half time because we changed at half time and I gave him my second jersey. I ended up selling them at auction for, for a charity a couple of years later. Um, I remember going on to uh, This Is Your Life, um, which is a total throwback for Jonah. And I actually had an operation that afternoon. I fell asleep on stage, which is not something that's great to do on a television program. But um, a couple of weeks after that, that game, and he was uh, he was just the sweetest guy. He had time for everybody. He would, if anything you ever wanted, I met him a lot. I met him in Hong Kong a good few times. Um, I think it was an awful shame uh, that, you know, obviously that he died so early. But more so than that, the fact that he had that kidney disease for his whole career, he was never operating at full speed, which is frightening on every possible level. I used to describe tackling him was as if there was a force field around his legs because you'd get into the right position and then he was 25 yards behind you, having knocked you um, all over the place. But uh, yeah, he's a, look, he's a lovely guy. Um, and I do, I, I actually, I, think I saw that photograph recently. And it's funny because when you look at guys who've, who've fallen, uh, as it were, with him passing away and Anthony Foley passing away, the two of those guys played against each other, both at number eight for Ireland schools against New Zealand schools back in the day, and they've both passed away. So, yeah, I think th these days are fantastic because you're looking back on good days or bad days and things when you don't, um, uh, when you didn't work out as well as you would have liked to. But also, it's kind of nice to remember some of the guys that have gone before. Yeah, sure. Greg, maybe to finish up that game, you know, obviously started a, a nice relationship for you with with Irish rugby coming back, as you mentioned, um, during our chat with, with Leinster. And then with Ireland. So great memories for you, I suppose, of that tour um, and then your relationship subsequently with, with Irish rugby. Yeah, it's, um, I think I will say it and, and, and I'm proud to say I do miss Ireland. You know, I spent seven years of my uh, well, nine seasons um, there, seven, nine years living there, uh, seven years permanently. Um, with my family, my kids were, were uh, did their primary schooling there. Um, so, you know, you, you think about that, and that's a huge part of your life, you know, first time riding a bike, first time learning to swim, um, and then I'm doing that family-wise, and then you've got all your um, sporting memories that uh, around that, and uh, you see your kids every day, so there's reminders of that still, you know, and there's names, and um, so, yeah, it'll always, it'll always have, a, have a special part, and there's so many good memories, so many good people, Um you know, I feel I feel very lucky um, to have had that experience. Um, I feel that my kids, um, they, they, they feel I feel like they'll go into the, this world that whatever it's going to be in the future, if you know what I mean. Um, but they'll go into it with more confidence, you know, in terms of being able to travel and whatever that will look like. Um, they're pretty excited by that still. Um, yeah, it's like I said, it's um, and I just I suppose if I was to say anything, it'd be thank you for the way. 
I was treated and and uh, welcomed into the the Irish people, you know. Um, but I always, if I, there's not that many Irish pubs in Christchurch, but I do stop and think, right, I need to, I should really have one, you know. Like that, that's kind of or whatever it is, you know. There's not many Irish things in Christchurch, to be fair, but just little reminders, you know. Sure. And Keith, as we mentioned throughout, it was a, it was a great time for yourself. Um, but at the Irish team, you know, John Mitchell describing it as one of the best Irish teams um, he had seen and, and so many of the players that we've mentioned throughout this going on to, to really achieve great careers in, in a green jersey. That was that was the start, as you say, of, of the, you know, the professional era and, and Irish rugby being able to kick it on to a new level. Yeah, I think a, a, an awful lot in, in that time. That was a mixture of, of, of styles, of players, of ages. Um, the reason that maybe changed it is a lot of the personnel changed soon afterwards. Certainly we started bringing young guys in and we still held on to a few old timers. But um, so by the time we went to 2003 World Cup, we had a good team. We had a good World Cup. We didn't quite get where we wanted to, but we were a damn sight closer than we had been. Australia beat us by a point and they, of course, drew with England and got finally beaten in the final. Um, but uh, I felt we were building up things all the time. From that period of time on, we seemed to start building different styles, expanding our game plan, um, bringing in a higher level of defence, uh, bringing in a higher level of attack because we had the players to be able to do it. You know, you don't play a 10-man game if you're Brian O'Driscoll in your team. You just don't. You, you can't. And so we suddenly started to expand far more what we were doing. That day showed we were able, actually, because we scored uh, some really good scores in the back line. Um, and uh, look, it took a few years, but most of those guys, by the time we got to 2004, 2005, most of those guys were players who hadn't played in the 90s. So they were guys who had a higher level of confidence in their own ability and in the ability of the team. And uh, things went up from there. So um, we had uh, a huge amount of foundation work that we did. And we didn't get to, to share some of those spoils, but we got to share it from afar. And I, I think a lot of those young guys that came through in 2001, 2002, 2003, look, they went on to have the best of Irish careers. I think that's a that's a good place to leave it. Keith and, and Greg, it's been it's been brilliant to chat and as well as take a trip down memory lane. So thanks very much for your time. Pleasure. Thanks, Ryan. Cheers, Vicky. Mind yourself. Real good.